one last thing before we get into today's episode. Um, just thought I would put this out there and let you guess. I figure most people, if you've been listening long enough, you probably know or be, will be able to figure it out. But one of these five stories is my true scary story from, uh, yeah, a while ago. Have fun figuring out which one you think it is. Guess in the comments below, whatever. All right, I'll leave you alone. Let's get into the stories. I worked deliveries in a really ritzy neighborhood in the Valley of California. The properties were stretched out along steep canyons and cliffs, so the roads are narrow and the driveways are always straight up and down. I was relatively new to the job and really enjoyed the different aspects of all of it. Driving all day on the clock, seeing beautiful places, unique houses, and the different people were all kind of a bonus for me. The story takes place before COVID, so delivery work was a little friendlier and not so scrutinized. One day, I had a particularly large shipment to disperse, and because of the layout of the neighborhood, I was just getting it done at a snail's pace, maybe even slower. I got a few packages jumbled up, found myself turning around more than once. The addresses on some of the homes were obscured by all kinds of nonsense, so locating some of the places was next to impossible. I didn't have a Tom Tom or Garmin to help me out. This was quite a while ago. I pride myself on being a low stress person, so I just took the one day, one mile, one package at a time. I did my best to lose myself in the scene views and radio hits, which honestly isn't hard to do out here. As the day wore on, I found myself with a rapidly dwindling load of mail, but the sun dipped and I realized that I was now working overtime. We usually had to check this out with a supervisor, but I would already gone over an hour at this point and I only had a few parcels left. So I just ran with it and decided to finish up. Because I was late, I started driving a little quicker and going right up to the houses instead of the end of the driveway. The less walking I did, the better, especially with the long roadways. I get the address off the next drop and start driving out into a darker area of the neighborhood. There's only a couple of houses out here and even then, and only one or two of them actually have lights on. These homes are the biggest out here. I've seen multi-million dollar homes with all kinds of crazy outdoor wreck. I pass a gate, take a turn, and find myself driving up a very long, lonely driveway up a hillside. Once I get to the top, the house is absolutely stunning. There's a multi-car garage and what looks like a guest house above that, and a terrace that connects it to the house, and then this utterly Romanesque house that towers above the cliffside. My first initial thought is, what the hell could this person have ordered that they don't actually already have? The package is mid-sized and kind of heavy, but I'm not nosy, so I don't shake it or anything. I walk it up to the door. Because it's late and the house is so out of the way, I don't bother ringing the doorbell. With my luck, it'll be a celebrity I like, and I'll have to disturb their private dinner party or something. As I turn and start heading back toward the van, one of the garage doors opens beside me. Lights spill out and illuminates the driveway. I turn to see a pair of headlights coming up the pass. They slow to a stop when they see me and then park jackknifed in front of the exit. I thought it was kind of weird, but then it occurred to me they might have security up here. I did pass through a gate, so maybe someone is coming to see what I was doing here, especially so late at night. I had the package already delivered, so I figured everything would be very easy to explain. The door opens. Out comes this tall, decently built guy. He's not threatening or anything, just has his hands in his pocket as he checks out my work van. When he sees it's the very recognizable logo, he nods and seems relieved. I say hello and explain that I've been behind all day. He says it's all fine. He didn't know who I was and then explained that he was having issues with trespassers on the property, especially over the last few months. I say how crazy that seems to me, considering how far out of the city we are, how isolated the cliff sides are. He smiles, says yeah, and it is crazy, but so are the people who keep showing up. I laugh, but he doesn't react after that, just stares at me with this weird glare, as if I'm one of those people sneaking around his property. Awkwardly, I tell him to have a good night and then start to walk back towards the van. He stops me and says, don't I have to sign for that? I shake my head and say no, not necessarily. He insists certain that I'm making some kind of mistake. He keeps staring me down with those dark, dead eyes. For as well put together as this guy is, his demeanor is legitimately scary, like crazy scary. 
I look over the spotless blacked out SUV that he just drove up the hill, and then it hits me. He's got to be on some kind of drugs. I ask him if he can move his car, to which he corrects me, says it's more like a truck. It has 4x4, a lift, all kinds of aftermarket additions. He then asks me if I want to see them, to which I decline. Now I'm getting seriously weirded out. Every time he speaks, he takes these little, almost unnoticeable steps towards me. And before long, he's only a couple of feet from me. He looks over my van and asks about the specs of it. I work for the delivery company. I don't know anything about the van. He nods and then does a lap around it, then starts telling me what he thinks about it. He compliments the suspension and then criticizes the paint. But he says he understands it's a car on the clock. Speaking of clock, I really need to get out of here. I ask him if he can move his truck again. He nods, but then holds out his hand. He asked if I have that paperwork for him to sign. Oh my god, you have to be kidding me. This guy was like coked out, obsessed with the notion of having some kind of receipt. I went to the van, wrote a slip for the package, out of sheer desire just to get out of here. The whole time I'm riding, he's still circling the van, telling me all kinds of weird stuff about it like the preferred gasoline, and how easy it'd be to cut the brake lines. Now I'm starting to sweat. I can see through the veneer of his wealth, and what I see is a total creep. Bad teeth, bad skin, eyes so dark that they're sunken, and they totally blend in with the dark night sky behind him. I signed the sticker and then handed it over to him. He looked it up and down and nodded, but didn't sign it. He asked me if I knew why he wanted that, and I told him no. He looked me in the eyes and said just in case anything bad happens to you, I can tell them that it didn't happen here. It's got the time you left and everything. He points to the camera on the corner of the garage, but didn't turn to look at it. Just made the gesture. He said his signature lined up at the time on the security system of when I left. I smiled and said thank you so much for your concern. I appreciate all the extra measures. He laughs. He said it was for him, not me. So now if I drove away and got raped and murdered and thrown off the cliffside, he wouldn't be involved in the investigation. It was like his alibi. These are his words, and he's now closing the last few steps between us. I backed into the driver's seat of the van, but he was so close. I couldn't even close the door. I started to panic, and the emotions rolled across my face. He stops, laughs then pats me on the shoulder. Don't be so anxious, he said. A job isn't worth getting stressed over. He backed up and then closed the door for me, tapped on the glass, and waved. I slammed the key into the ignition, secured everything in the van while he moved his car and then parked it in the garage. I remember turning around and casting one more look at this guy. He was just standing there in the light of his garage door, hand still in his pocket, when he saw I was looking, he pointed up to the camera, then tapped his watch. I've never driven faster in my life. No idea if this guy was coked up, a psycho, or just messing with the delivery girl. But from there on out, I was not as friendly with people that I delivered to. This actually happened two weeks ago. I don't think anything will ever top this experience for me. I had gotten a new delivery location as we totally rotated regions within the station and other DSPs. I would gotten a town an hour and a half away from the station, with only around 90 stops. This was known as a cakewalk delivery region, so I was actually kind of looking forward to it. Everything went well. I finished in the town deliveries and so far everyone I encountered seemed to be incredibly kind. This was until my last 10 or maybe 20 stops, which were rural and then outside of that town. When I mentioned this to my last townie delivery, he wrinkled his nose, told me to be careful. Some of the locals were nothing but trouble. I was a little excited at this prospect. What kind of weird activity would I get a front row seat to? The stuff in my head was way funnier than what I actually encountered. People were well beyond poor, but actually cratered into poverty. Some of the kids watched me drive by. It seemed like they'd never seen a delivery van before. I got to an address way out in the boonies. As soon as I entered their driveway, 
It was filled with random garbage everywhere. Microwaves, chairs, washers, dryers, wheels. Everything you'd think you'd find in a dump. I was certain that I was going to end up popping a tire driving through all of this stuff. I drove all the way into their driveway to find that there was no house. Just a small place to turn around in. I ended up turning around, confused where this house could be. As I was driving out the way I came, I slowly looked around to find anywhere just to leave this package. I spot this small shack, probably half the size of my van. I was just going to go tuck it in the inlet so it wouldn't get wet if it rained. I didn't expect anyone to actually be inside this desolate little heap. But as soon as I got close and set the package down, a dude who looked like he hadn't showered in months or even changed clothes came out with a hunting knife and a gun tucked inside his belt. That startled me, so I started stepping back a bit, thinking of ways to retreat to my van without getting stabbed or shot. My van was a good distance away since I parked it on firm ground, and that shack was on marshy grass. I also thought running would definitely escalate the situation, since the guy came out asking me who I was, why I was on his property. I explained that I was with Amazon. He had a package. He shouted back all of that was impossible. He didn't have Wi-Fi, a computer, or even a cell phone. He didn't get packages out here. I replied maybe a family member or a friend could have sent him a package, but... If he didn't want it, I could take it back. He went on to say all of his family is dead, then asked if I wanted to know how they died. I replied back with, no, I'm okay, and that I was just going to leave the package. This upset him more. He then told me people who drive unmarked vans out here get shot. At this point, I'm thinking this dude is going to take his gun out, so I asked him if he knew why we had to use white vans instead of our Amazon branded vans which surprisingly seemed to de-escalate the situation. I explained that some of the white vans have four-wheel drive for the hills and the dirt and gravel roads up here, and Amazon-branded ones don't. I'm honestly just trying to talk my way out or de-escalate it, whatever I have to do at this point. Then the guy tells me to wait. He has a surprise. Goes back inside his shack again. I'm thinking I need to fast walk to my van, but he comes out, told me he needed his box. He wanted to trade me something for it. I declined. I told him I would just leave it on the ground for him to take. I didn't need anything. I said it was really time for me to get going because I had a million other deliveries. For whatever reason, logic then seemed to speak to this guy. He goes on to produce this huge Ziploc bag of what looks like meth crystals and weed, all shaken and smashed together. He told me, you can have it. I don't know how I just noticed this now, but... When I looked to the guy's right, I noticed something hanging up from the wall. I couldn't believe my eyes at first, but sure enough, it was a dead dog strapped to the overhang. It was mangled and decaying. It had clearly been up there for a while. It was beyond horrific and really put the situation in perspective for me. I looked back at the guy who's shaking this big bag of meth and weed. I told him, I'm good, man. I'm on the job right now. He then pointed his knife at me and started to approach, and then at that point, I just turned around and started walking back toward the van. He said he just wanted me to take his knife and open the box since he thought it wasn't Amazon. He was sure the box would explode if he opened it, so he wanted me to do it instead. I sliced it open in two seconds, then sprinted back to my van. I had actually made it out of there without getting knifed or shot, although I might have contracted something from touching that knife. I drove up the road a bit until I was a good distance from that hut, then had a total mental breakdown. It was just some of the craziest stuff of my career. I just let the anxiety wash over me as I replayed what the hell just took place. I made a statement with my dispatch and they sent it to OTR, but apparently Amazon didn't deem what happened bad enough to blacklist the address unless I made a case number with the police. I didn't want to get that involved, so I just let it go once I transferred to a new region. We all just watch for that lot number now, expecting someone else to have to go pay him another visit. This took place in 2016. I work for the USPS delivering mail in the Midwest. I've been at this job for around five years 
and I can honestly say I've met and encountered some very unique individuals to say the least. I will give you a quick description of myself because I feel it's relevant to the story and how I don't look exactly like your typical mailman. I'm a male around 6 foot, 195 pounds, covered in tattoos with long blonde hair and gauges. Although many people have told me I don't look approachable, I am friendly. I'm kind to everyone I encounter, especially while working. Now back to the actual event itself. I'd recently started a new route, and since I was so low on the totem pole, seniority wise, this route wasn't exactly in the nicest neighborhoods. Towards the end of the day, I would finish my route down this long stretch of road with a lot of decrepit houses that were either vacant or even barely livable, at least in my opinion. With only a few deliveries remaining, my last package for the day was for a Mr. Smith and what looked like to be medication from the VA hospital. Myself being a fellow vet thought, well, at least I know me and him will get along nicely. Mr. Smith's trailer was located down a small narrow dirt path that also had three or four other trailers around it. As I said earlier, this was my first day on this route, so finding the actual trailer belonging to him was going to take a moment or two, seeing that they weren't labeled with any actual numbers. Most of the other trailers that were around it had garbage and random objects lying around, as well as windows being smashed and graffiti on them, so I assumed those weren't the ones that were occupied. There was only one that stuck out and looked halfway livable, so I guessed and assumed this was the one. I jumped out of my truck and headed up the stairs, and then gently knocked on the door. I hear footsteps approach the door right before it's yanked open, revealing a very large man, 6'6 six six or 6'7, six easily pushing 300 plus pounds. He bellowed out this booming, yeah? I quickly stammered out, hey sir, I have a package that needs a signature for Mr. Smith. He replies with, oh yeah, that's my father, but I can sign for it for him. No problem. It's a frequent thing for family to sign for other family, so I handed him the slip of paper. He fumbled with it, trying to find a surface to write on, and it was then I immediately smelled all the booze, quickly realizing that this dude was hammered. It took him way longer than it should have to scribble a name down onto that slip. He finally hands it back to me, and I handed him the small parcel. Immediately, I gave him a, alright, have a good evening, man, as I was about to leap off the porch head back to the office and call it a day and have a few drinks myself. It's been a long week. Just as I was getting off the porch, he yelled out at me. Hey, uh, is that a Michael the Archangel and Lucifer tattooed on your arm? I turned around and replied, yeah, it is, politely chuckling. He then told me he's got a painting in the garage of them. It looks exactly like that tattoo. I'm thinking to myself in the moment, all right, cool, man, that's random as hell. But out loud, I spoke. Wow, that's crazy, man. Cool. I turned around, walking back to my truck again. But as I did so, he yelled out to me once more. You want to see it? Internally to myself, I thought, not really. I really don't care. But I mumbled out to him. Sorry, man. I need to get back to the office, unfortunately. But before I actually got back into the truck to leave, he darted over to the garage and then insisted I come in. It will only take a second. Without actually saying it, he held out his arm and gave that after you motion, now to an open garage door. Before I even realized what I was doing, I found myself stepping inside, cursing myself for being a people pleaser and having a hard time saying no or being rude to people. Although it was 5 p.m. in the middle of summer and the sun still out shining brightly, the garage itself was pitch black. I noticed that two small windows were covered with newspaper. An initial weird, sketchy situation was now getting even sketchier. He closed the door, and I was immediately plunged into complete darkness. I then muttered aloud, Uh, it's kind of dark in here. He followed back chuckling. Yeah, give me a sec, I'll, uh, I'll get the light. A few moments pass, I hear a soft click, as he pulls the string on this tiny light bulb, which barely illuminated anything. It was enough to notice, though, that the floor was completely covered in empty liquor and beer bottles. Trash, and of course, rusty tools were all strewn about. He moves past me and walked to what appeared to be the back room of the garage and then just stood at the threshold. It's back here. Come take a look. With this sheepish grin on his face. 
Now alarms were shrieking. Red flags were shooting up even higher than before. I've listened to enough let's not meet and let's read stories over the years to know better than to walk back there. I've been in quite a few sketchy situations over the years, with the tour in Afghanistan and plenty of other instances. I'm no Billy Badass by any means, but I'm comfortable and confident enough to know I can hold my own when I need to. I was terrified. Something about this man was just off. His mannerisms, his presence itself just creeped me out. And now I need an excuse to get the hell out of here. So I finally took hold of the wheel and put my politeness and kindness in the back seat. I knew if I pressed the enter button on my scanner that was located on my hip, it would beep loudly, seeing as if I hadn't actually scanned a barcode. I took my right hand and pressed the button. The loud beep emitted through the air, and I put on the best acting scene of my life, pretending I'd gotten a message from my boss, saying he needed me back at the office ASAP. Shit, I said loudly. My boss needs me back for something. Sorry, man. Another time for sure. As I backpedaled out, and lightly jogged back to my truck, as I stole a final glance at him before leaving. That grin was gone, now replaced with this stern, pissed-off grimace. When I returned back to the office, I relayed that story to my supervisor. He agreed it was weird and creepy, but couldn't even comprehend why I even entered that garage. He also told me if I was uncomfortable making future deliveries, I could notice the packages, and Mr. Smith would have to come to the post office itself to pick up them. I felt bad that I would be forcing an older fellow vet to go out of his way regularly, but I wasn't wanting to encounter his son again if I didn't have to. So from there on out, that's exactly what I did. Maybe he did have that painting back there. Maybe he didn't. Either way, I really don't give a shit. So to that drunken Ed Kemper lookalike, I don't want to meet again. I grew up in Florida throughout the late 70s and 80s. This was back in the days of the cocaine cowboys and list of unsolved murders when Florida was like the Wild West. I remember headlines comparing the homicide rate of Miami and Los Angeles to see which was the most dangerous city. More often than not, it was a wash. My dad worked for the post office back then and got me my first job as a mail carrier. It was a pretty brain dead gig as I just took letters to the boxes and bigger packages to the porches and doorsteps. Still, I liked it for what it was. I got to drive a four-door cutlass that had air conditioning and a radio. These were the true luxuries to my 16-year-old self, to be able to listen to whatever music I desired, while I made a couple of bucks. My dad didn't work as a mail carrier anymore because he'd been with the post office for so long. He worked in the brick and mortar building, fully promoted to desk work and scheduling, logistics of every kind. That said, he worked the beat for many years, knew the ins and outs, and the dangers one could enter while delivering mail. My dad made sure to always express how careful I needed to be, which neighborhoods required me to be on high alert. One day in the early summer, I was all the way across town, delivering the mail like usual. The neighborhoods I was servicing were outliers, what most of the city dwellers called rural as this is where one would start to see dirt roads and the beginnings of a small town life. Out here, most of the folks getting mail have delivered it in the big standing communal boxes, where there's a little slot with your address on it. I didn't like having the crates of loose mail in the car, so I would always start with these to get those deliveries first. It started sliding around the car if I wasn't driving carefully, and if it slid around, it was much harder to deliver. In the bins, it was at least somewhat organized by destination. If it slid out of the tubs, I was on my own to figure out where it went. And since it was my dad running the post office, I was returning to, well, you better believe I wasn't allowed to return with any mail, not even of the junk variety. I'm back in one of those rural neighborhoods, filling up one of the boxes when a car drives by. I turned and waved, big toothy smile, as many of the people I delivered to had come to know and like me. I didn't recognize this car though. It had the kind of aesthetic you'd see downtown where the money lives. The windows were really dark and the rims were shiny. It wasn't just a cool car and it wasn't just some kind of gangster car. To my 16 year old brain, this thing was certifiably pimp. And that was a big deal to say back then, especially in Florida. 
As a young white kid, pimp was the pinnacle of cool for me. The car drifted by and gave me a weird feeling. It was definitely out of place out here in the boonies, and with it being unfriendly to boot, I didn't really know what to think. Maybe it was an undercover cop. A few of my friends in school had dads who were cops. Some of them told stories about detectives. They got to drive cool cars, carry better guns. At least, that's what we always heard. I kept an eye on it as it rolled down the road, carefully not to turn and fully look through. I just didn't want any trouble. Like I said, this was Florida. Shit was absolutely crazy back then, just like it is now. But I had my dad in my ear, telling me just how crazy things could get. My brain was already racing with the notions of hitman, human trafficking, God knows what. I just did my best to focus on the mail so I could get finished and just move on. I felt very vulnerable with my back to the street like that. It was probably nothing, and by now they were almost out of sight. But just then, that car stops. It lurched with the transmission and slowly rolled backwards into a driveway before turning around. The car is coming right back at me now, and I've only got a few letters left. I'd taken a few karate classes back then, so I knew breathing techniques could help you focus, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't planting my feet just in case I needed to throw a tremendous spinning back kick. It rolls up on me, and just keeps going. It was an older couple from what I could see, wearing their Sunday best and completely lost. They waved and drove back the way they came. I finished up the mailboxes with a little incident. For whatever reason, the slowness of that dark sedan triggered my fight or flight and just put me on edge for the rest of the afternoon. This actually came to be habitat for me for the rest of my life after living in Florida. Personal security is a huge priority for me. After I finished the mail there, there was one job left, which was to go to door to door with the bigger parcels. Fortunately, there were only a few of them that day. My system was very simple. I would go to the furthest address first, then slowly start working my way back until everything was delivered. That made it to where, when the last drop-off was done, I was relatively close to the country roads that would take me back to town. The first address is a shoebox sized package, nothing heavy, but the address is in one of the neighborhoods my dad has warned me about many, many times. I'm not nervous, but I'm on high alert after my encounter with that weird car. I just wanted to be done with the workday. When I get to the first house, it's pretty deep in the thicket of trees, and the brush are shrouding my view of it. The entire property is lined with a tall fence. The gate is secured with a sign that says no trespassing. I shrug and start to turn the car around when I saw a second sign dangling by some tape from the first. The message was simple, exactly what I didn't want to see. It said, Mailman okay. I saddled up the cutlass on the side of the street, grabbed the package, and one other thing before getting out of the car. A canister of pepper spray my dad had bought me from when I started the job. He insisted that I keep it in the car or in my pocket, just in case anything ever happened. He explained that he carried one for years, actually had to use it a few times himself. I slipped it into my pocket and made for the gate. It was a simple, single latch system. I considered leaving it open just in case anything got weird, but decided it wasn't worth all that trouble. Between my karate skills, youth, and pocket full of mace, I fancied myself pretty unstoppable. I casually walked down the driveway until I spotted the house, this ramshackle dump that screamed of criminal activity. Half-stripped cars in the front yard, a cracked front window. It could have been just poverty, but it felt like it was something way more to me. I knocked, received no response, so I elected to simply just leave the package by the door. The house was private enough that there was no chance of theft. As I turned back to the yard to head for the car, I caught some movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to find a big, ugly dog staring me down. It came out from under one of the cars, and it looked starving and extremely pissed. This didn't deter me at first. I'm a dog guy. I've always been. So I tried to relax and reached one hand out before me as a peace offering. Dog didn't like that. It charged me all teeth and eyes, literally frothing at the mouth. Mailman okay? That was a sick joke. Did I just get lured into some hillbilly's idea of a practical joke? As it barreled me down, I realized my miscalculation. I wasn't indestructible, and this dog was way bigger than I first thought. 
It had already made a move which only left one option for me. I pulled the pepper spray out of my pocket and turned the nozzle to the business mode and aimed it right at the dog. The problem with this was, it didn't give a shit. It had no idea what I was holding. My brandishing it obviously had no effect whatsoever. I hit the button, watched as a big misty cloud filled the air, but not in the right direction. In my panic to get the mace out of my pocket, I mistakenly turned the nozzle so it was aiming right between myself and the dog. We watched as we both reacted to the chemicals, retreated and then respectively started to freak out. For 15 minutes, me and that dog are rolling around in the dirt, howling for help. No one was home, so no one came. After a while we recovered, but only in the sense that we weren't crying and screaming. Neither of us could see or smell, which turned out to be an advantage. I knew this dog was going to be royally pissed off now, and would still have an interest in tearing me apart. Now that we're both blind, if it gets a hold of me, it's over. Done for. I rolled to my right to create some distance between us, and I remember that it's pretty much just an open yard over there. Nothing to get hung up in. Once I felt the dirt change to grass beneath me, I stopped to get to my knees. My vision is shot, but I can see outlines and some shapes and colors. I can see the striped car in front of me, the dog writhing off to the left of them. For almost the next 30 minutes, I tiptoed across the yard, desperately trying not to get to the attention of this dog. I couldn't run because if I tripped and it heard me, it'd probably be able to find me. So I walked as slowly and as calmly as I could, stopped whenever I got too loud, until I reached the fence. The dog eventually recovered a bit, started sniffing around the yard for me, but couldn't get the scent. He did get close a few times. I just freeze up until he moved on. Once I got free of the yard, the trouble was just starting. How was I going to get the car back to the post office? I sat on the bumper and rinsed my eyes out with water for an hour or two, but it didn't help. Finally, someone pulled up beside me and asked if I needed help. I didn't get suspicious when I heard the car tires that time. They got a hold of my dad at the post office who came out and finished the deliveries and the car got home. He laughed at my swollen eyes the whole rest of the weekend. The pandemic forced a lot of people to search for new employments and opportunities, especially during the initial economic onset. Uber Eats, DoorDash, Amazon, all of them saw crazy surges in traffic when cities ordered people to stay indoors. Many places deemed these drivers essential workers, which kept me employed for several unstable months throughout COVID. I became a delivery driver out of necessity back then, but actually still had to do it part-time on the weekends still. My story takes place during 2020, when no one really knew what the future had in store. I was working for a big name delivery company, one of the largest cities in the United States. At the time, I was constantly behind by at least a day's worth of deliveries, if not more. Strikes are going on. People are ordering more stuff than ever before. It was a lot to handle and it made a pretty high stress work environment. One day I see a meme about how all we do is pee into water bottles and then lose packages. Honestly, it was the golden age for delivery driver memes. Because of how behind I was on my route, I started working overtime pretty much every day. Instead of delivering from nine to five, I'd start at eight in the morning and then just go until I was totally burnt out, which is usually around 7 p.m., maybe a little longer if I had a Red Bull that day. It was one of my last packages for the night, and I remember thinking to myself that it could just wait till morning and be my first delivery the next day. I was really hungry and just wanted to put my feet up, but the destination was nearby. I'm a go-getter, so I just went, and the parcel was no bigger than my fist. It wasn't spending the night in my truck, so I wish I wasn't so stubborn. Why didn't I just go home like I wanted to? The essential worker tag was going to my head. I pull up outside of this apartment complex, and I'm talking chalk line outlines on the sidewalk, caution tape rippling in the breeze. Not literally, but you get what I mean. Groups of guys patrolling the parking lot, milling around the dark corner, big dogs barking from every tiny gate, bullet holes in some of the cars. I'm in a big city, and some of the underbelly is seedy almost unsightly. I scan the package in my hand, and I leave the truck and search the actual address. From what I can see, it seems to be a ground floor resident, 
And thank God I don't have to climb 10 flights of stairs just to hand off this bulk chapstick. Or whatever the hell it is. I locked the truck behind me just to be safe. There's nothing in it to steal, but this neighborhood is just not worth gambling in. After perusing around, I find the building that it's actually in, and then finally the unit. It's a dingy corner apartment with all the windows covered with all kinds of crazy shit. Tin foil, movie posters, food boxes, like cereal, you name it. It's all blocking the light out of this dump. I get a weird feeling the second I see it, but hey, I'm almost out of here. I walk around to the front and find a guy leaning against a tree, smoking a cigarette. I gave him a courtesy nod to which he offers a two-finger salute. Standard guy exchange in my city. I turn my heel and approach the front door. I've already decided I don't want to be here anymore, so I hit the bell and place the package on the floor. As I'm standing back up, the door rips open in front of me with this agitated energy. It's every driver's nightmare on shift. The irritated, panicked where you have to be recipient of whoever wants to jam you up like they're a cop. As I get upright, I can see this is different though. This guy is real thin, half-dressed, and just covered in what I can only assume to be track marks. He's dirty, unwashed, and the living room behind him was disgusting. We make eye contact, I say hello, and then I turn to leave. What the hell, man? I've been waiting for you all day, he shouts at me. I turn back around and shrug, offer my normal apology. Hey, we're understaffed, man. What more can I say? Well, I think I saw you drop my package, no? I come to a full stop. I have no idea what this guy is talking about. I point at the one at his feet and asked if he meant that one. Yeah, man, I watched you throw it against the door. It's probably broken. I start to argue, but the whole thing is a racket. The guy behind me smoking a cigarette is a friend of the guy in the apartment. And the guy in the apartment says, Hey, did you see him do it? And of course, cigarette guy nods and says, Yep, I saw the whole thing. Now this is turning into an actual problem. Not just them trying to report me or something, but being surrounded by potentially dangerous criminals. They try to usher me inside the apartment so we can get it all worked out. But I have my own protocol to follow, and right near the top of the list is never get made to go anywhere, especially on shift. The guy in the apartment pulls out a gun right out of his pants pocket and points it right at my face. The entire conversation stops and we're all just looking at the trigger, waiting. He asked me to reconsider going inside and that all of this is just a big misunderstanding. The guy with the cigarette puts his smoke out, grabs my elbow, and then leads me inside. My heart is pounding through my chest at this point. Anything could happen. After we get into the living room and they shut the door, all of my suspicions are confirmed. This place is a crack house, without a doubt. And these two clowns are a couple of dealers. Radical. Exactly where I want to be. The guy puts the pistol away pretty much the second they got the door locked. He seemed even nervous to have it out, which did come as a relief to me. Not a fan of him waving it around either. The scariest part was actually the door. Once they got me inside, the whole situation devolved into an episode of the Three Stooges. They tried to call my office for 15 minutes. They were so strung out, they couldn't even look at the phone for longer than a minute to actually pull up the number and then hit dial. From what I gathered, these guys have run out of whatever they were actually addicted to and were filling out the cravings with whatever they could get their hands on. To say these guys were high wasn't accurate. They looked like they hadn't slept in days, running on fumes of whatever dust was left at the bottom of the bag. That's when they came up with a scam that they were trying to pull. Like everyone else, they'd seen dozens of videos online of careless drivers dumping packages over fences and things like that. So they ordered something small and cheap off of Amazon, then painstakingly waited at the door for it to arrive, just to peg a fake crime on an innocent, unsuspecting driver. I wondered how long that guy had been leaning up against the tree, waiting for me to show up. They were completely crazy. It was actually kind of entertaining. They thought they were going to get a payout of some kind right in the middle of the night, like us delivery guys carry a little fallback cash just in case we break something. I couldn't quite understand the logic, but I appreciate the desperation. I encouraged them just a little, just to see how far they'd actually go, how much more they'd come up with to justify all this craziness. Trying to get them to just focus on the phone was the funniest part though. I had to keep it within reason. 
These guys did force me in here. They did have a gun. So it wasn't all fun and games or anything. Something got their attention in the back of the apartment. Both of their heads snapped and they reacted to something that I couldn't see or hear. I'm assuming it was just typical hallucinations from staying awake for so long. Either way, they both thought that they could hear someone breaking in and sneaking around the back bedroom. One of them is turning the drawers in the kitchen upside down looking for a flashlight. The other guy's just yelling, keeping an eye on the dark hall in front of him. They don't find a flashlight, but they're both holding cell phones and this seems to be kind of my chance, so I tell them both of their phones have a flashlight. They just have to turn it on. They both go mental at this realization and frantically flick their lights on. They tell me to keep an eye on the front door and watch their backs. I nod like we're old war buddies and I'd never let them down. As they went down the hallway and checked the rooms, I slowly shuffled back to the door and unlatched the deadbolt. The last thing I saw was the glare of the cell phone lights against the dingy back wall and the shaky silhouettes of the pistol going from one room to the other. Absolute chaos. I wasn't out of the woods yet though. I still needed to get back to my truck in this sketchy complex and then navigate my way out of the slums and back into the city. It was much later than I thought and all I wanted to do was just get home. I went from a walk to a light jog as to not draw too much attention. Everything was going smoothly until I reached the parking lot when I hear something behind me. I still don't know exactly what I heard but it, it sounded like someone running up on me. So I whirled around and there's no one there. All right, now I'm hearing things. As I turn to face back into the parking lot, I rotate just in time and step into the angled antenna of one of the car that's nearest to me. It had been bent at the base, so it just jutted out instead of going straight up and down. That antenna was also perfectly level with my eye, and it pushed right beneath the lid and then right behind my actual eye. I harpooned my own face in a mad dash to get the hell out of this place. There's no grace in that reaction. In a panic, I flailed backward to get away from whatever was causing the pain, only to injure myself worse. That antenna had a little bead on the end, which I could feel putting pressure between my eye. That metal rod must have been inside my eye at least an inch or two. When I pulled myself backwards, all of it slid out the same way it went in, and the pain was beyond all measure. Droplets of blood are now leaking from the base of my eye. I was stuck within 15 feet of the security of my delivery truck, but I can't see the keys to open up the door. I stumbled to the back and sat on the bumper, just holding my eye and praying that it didn't fall out. After around 45 minutes, my vision cleared up a little, but the pain was still explosive. I managed to get back into the truck and then slowly drive back toward my house, as we didn't have to return them if we were behind. We just swap it out for a totally new, fully loaded truck in the morning. My eye thankfully didn't fall out, but I did require some pretty involved visits to the doctor for around 18 months after that. I like to think that those crackheads are still holed up in that apartment, looking for a phantom burglar. They probably don't even remember taking me hostage. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you, just, you, know, you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, guys, and uh, kudos to you who figured it out or... Whether you did or you didn't, I will confirm or deny in the comment section below. Um, my goal for this week is to do three episodes since I only technically only did one last week outside of the stories for sleep. So today's delivery tomorrow, Wednesday will be um, retail. And then after that, uh, I think dark web. So, yeah, um, again, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had a good time with it. Um, and I've lost my train of thought. Um, the weather is shitty here. It's like ice, ice baby everywhere on the road. So can't really do anything. So I'm going to start on the next episode. So I'll make sure that I get three out this week. With that being said, enjoy your day. Enjoy your week. Enjoy it all. Live, love, laugh, eat, 
drink be merry i'm rambling don't know what else to say so yeah i'll see you in the next one guys cheers